has a stellar academic CV, which makes it a very unusual CV for, for a politician. Uh, and uh, he studied economics and law at the University of Valladolid, his hometown in Spain. He got a master's uh, in European economic studies at the College of Europe in Bruges in 92, also at University of Chicago. He then got his PhD uh, there and was advisor to Sherwin Rosen, the famous labor economist, also teaching assistant to Gary Becker, Kevin Murphy, I don't need to add uh, more to that. Um, and then he stayed at Chicago uh, as an assistant professor, then associate and full professor in 2006, also visiting at MIT Sloan, at Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, at London Business School. In 2008, uh, Louis uh, crossed the Atlantic again. He became a professor of economics and strategy and at the LSE, the London School of Economics, also co-founder of the new management department there and uh, in charge of this new building, uh, there's, a, there's an anecdote that you were the one to which Queen Elizabeth the second asked uh, why nobody saw the great financial crisis coming, Louis. Is that true? That is correct, yes. So what was, did you answer? Um, I answered that, uh, the, uh, the, sadly, the, everybody followed uh, their incentives as they should, so that it was the system as a whole that didn't work and that uh, wow. we, so you we needed really to fix the system. You were teaching her the basic of microeconomics. That's. Uh, I, I actually did. I actually did a presentation to her uh, on on the. Oops. Uh, I did a presentation to her on the on the financial crisis, and uh, I was trying to change the, the camera. So now I did. I did a presentation to her on the financial crisis, and I explained her everything about the microeconomics of uh, securitizations. <laughs> okay. Well, I I won't ask more questions about that conversation. <laughs> Anyway, in 2017, you joined the Instituto de Empresas in Madrid. Uh, also, in the meantime, you had been very uh, involved in Spanish public life. Uh, you founded the prominent blog Nada es Gratis in 2009. Um, and uh, relevant to our session today, from 2012 to 2016, you were a board member at Liberbank, uh, one of the banks that were consolidated into uh, Spanish banking crisis. Um, in 2015, you joined Ciudadanos, uh, the um, centrist party in Spain. Uh, you were in charge of their economic program. You uh, wrote a book with uh, fellow economist Tony Roldan, Recuperar el Futuro, uh, Reclaiming the Future. In that context, in December 2016, you became a vice president of ALDES, a European grouping of uh, centrist liberal parties. And of course, uh, in uh, 2019, you became a member of the European Parliament. Uh, where you've been uh, very active in matters of uh, financial sector policy and uh, financial uh, legislation. Jeremy Settlemeyer uh, studied economics in Bonn in 1990, uh, had his, his degree, a PhD at MIT in economics in 1995, so three years before Louis. Um, uh, and then you had uh, an early career at the International Monetary Fund at the research department, Western Hemisphere and European departments from 1994 to 2008. Uh, then Yermin was at the European Bank for Reconstruction of and Development, the EBRD in London, as director of research from 2008 to 2014. You were the editor of the Transition Report, which is the flagship uh, publication of the EBRD. And then in Berlin uh, for two years at the uh, uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, uh, as Director General of Economic Policy. Um, then came the main uh, highlight from my perspective, which is when you joined uh, the Peterson Institute for International Economics in 2016, uh, where you became the Dennis Weatherstone Senior Fellow. Uh, we have very few uh, endowed uh, fellowships at the Peterson Institute, so that's uh, the ultimate badge of honor in our team. And uh, in 2009, you went back to the IMF uh, on leave from the Institute, where you're the Deputy Director of the Strategy Policy and Review Department uh, there. So thanks to both for having um, accepted our invitation. We'll discuss, of course, the banking union and whether it will ever get to completion. Um, Louis, over to you. you uh, I will ask you to uh, speak for 10 minutes, and then we'll give it back to Jeremy. OK, well, thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you, Jeremy. It's, it's great uh, to, to be here with both of you. Jeremy and me have been uh, talking a lot during the financial crisis about uh, what to do with the European uh, institutions and about uh, what to do with, with, 
with our incomplete economic and complete economic and monetary union and and and, and Nikolai, I've also talked to you a lot about this, so it's really like like being at home. Thanks, thanks a lot for this. Um, so, will will the European Union complete the banking union? What's left? What's the what's the what's the problem? So let me just remind you. Uh, very, very briefly, 30 seconds, uh, where we were in the financial crisis. The, the main issue that we were concerned about was the doom loop. Uh, sovereigns who were uh, on the hook for rescuing banks through bailouts and banks which were holding so many sovereign uh, bonds that when the sovereigns were in trouble, the bank's assets were really, really in trouble. So. The sovereigns made the banks sick and the banks made the sovereigns sick and everybody who's watching knows the story going forward in Spain and Ireland from banks to the states, going backwards from states to banks in Greece and Portugal and other places. Um, this led to fragmentation and led to something that we didn't know existed in Europe. Maybe the American economists knew it, which was the redenomination risk. We really didn't think that the markets could panic about the possibility that that their deposits would be denominated in a different currency than the one they, they thought they had. And as a response to all this, the European Union said, we really need a banking union. Deposit has to be worth the same in one country or another. Um, the banking union had three pillars. You know, in Europe, things have to have pillars. Uh, that's the that's a basic, a basic lesson that we all learn when we get our European uh, experience and the three pillars were the supervisor ssm which is a europe-wide supervisor which i think we probably and nicola and jeremy and me will agree that it works well there's a resolution SSM the single supervisory mechanism sorry for oh i apologize I, I promised i promised nicola not to use all this and i am immediately need to be stand corrected a single supervisory mechanism i won't use any more of those crazy uh, euro euro abbreviations a resolution mechanism uh, to prevent taxpayer taxpayer dollars being used in bailouts. This pillar is not working very well, and I want to talk a little bit about that in a sec. And then deposit insurance, which is the third pillar, to ensure that when the bank goes under, it's not making appeal to the liquidity kind from the member states, but it's making appeal to uh, common uh, instruments. Now, the first pillar, as I said, works well, good supervision. The second one needs very deep reforms. Um, Nicola himself has written a lot and very good about this. And the third was never really agreed to. It was, uh, we are on year five or six in Parliament of a proposal to do uh, deposit insurance. Um, the cross-border border lending never recovered. The market is really fragmented. Banks continue to get uh, more and more government debt. We continue to see bailouts. The, the, the resolution mechanism, I think, is, is the biggest surprise as a failure. It did one resolution, which was in Spain, Banco Popular. But then there were two instances uh, in which really things didn't work out uh, uh, in Italy and in Germany, uh, Nord Elbe, a public bank in, in Germany that has been rescued by the state, uh, Veneto banks in Italy, 60 billion in assets. You can't say those are small, uh, that were also rescued by the Italian state. So the problem is that Banking union has been stalled. Uh, ADS has been proposed in 2015 and again in 2017. Um, and we have seen a little bit of, of movement. Um, before the pandemic started, the German uh, government, which is a, a more progressive uh, finance minister, uh, Jeremy can tell us a little bit about that, being very, very well, uh, very well best in, in those ins and outs, um, came up with the idea that we we really should have a European deposit insurance and that in order to break the deposit, the, the doom loop, we should have some sort of European safe asset. Uh, um, so there was some, uh, some movement there and there's been actually concrete legislative movement in the council on a backstop for the single resolution fund, basically access to liquidity. Let me tell you that Popular has been considered, and, and by you, if you've read the Anglo-Saxon uh, press, as a positive example of this resolution fund. But because there was no backstop, uh, no, no liquidity in resolution, and because the bank, the deposit insurers in Spain didn't have money and the, and the Bank of Spain didn't have uh, access to liquidity for these purposes, uh, then the view in Spain at the time, and I was kind of quite close to the government and during that rescue, was that, um, 
if at six o'clock in the morning, when when Alvarez, the CEO of Santander, and and Botin, the, the president, were called uh, to confirm that they would buy the bank, they were called for the first time at eleven thirty in the night, the night before. This is a Tuesday, okay? You all know you never do a rescue on Tuesday. You do it on Friday and have the whole weekend to work everything out. Tuesday night, eleven, they are called. First thing that tells you resolution didn't work as it should have. The reason they could do this is because two weeks before they had been looking into the books to see if they would buy them. If not, in six hours, are you going to commit to buy a gigantic bank? No. They spend the night, they do their due diligence, they get a call at six o'clock in the morning from, from LK Kenning and from the Spending Resolution Board. Will you take it over? If at that time, six, six thirty, you know, time passes fast, they say no. There was literally no solution. We would have had to close the doors of these banks, put the police in the door, hope that this gets systemic, that people don't start to panic about other banks, cross our fingers, and try to sell it uh, using the resolution toolbox. So there is liquidity and resolution is important. And this year, we're expecting some further uh, moves. We're going to have reforms to the capital requirements in Basel III. That's going to be an opportunity to, to get the system more solid. It's interesting because in Europe, we always do the... They, everybody thinks of Basel III as doing some housekeeping and not doing the rest, when in fact, I don't know, Nicolas, how you see it in Germain, but you could actually use Basel III to build the whole package. But anyway, they're going to do that separate. Then there is going to be a broad reform of the resolution insolvency framework. We are thinking that the presidency of France is a great opportunity to do it. It is to do deposit insurance. We don't know if that's going to happen. And a lot of work is going to depend on... Uh, what happens uh, with the roadmap that is going to be discussed in June uh, in council? Is the council really going to be uh, daring to, to, to move this all of this package? My current expectation is Basel for the summer, the rest of the package, uh, BRD, sorry, uh, the resolution directive, the, the deposit uh, insurance, uh, et cetera, for the, for the fourth quarter of the year, the emergency uh, tools, the crisis tools. We see two key aspects of the EDIS legislation and negotiation. The first one is um, the long term and the steady state, and another one is the transition. The, the issue here that worries us a lot is that, it worries me a lot, is that um, EDIS needs to fit into a broader project. We worry very much about having a temporary transition that becomes permanent, about having a uh, it, it is that we say, well, we start with just some liquidity so that one deposit insurance gives a deposit to the other and not to make a step forward that would actually uh, give us a true deposit insurance, stay in this halfway house and not really have a transition. And of to, course, uh, sorry to interrupt again, it is please, please. the European deposit insurance scheme. Yes, the deposit insurance scheme. Thank you, Nicola. I did say the first time I used, but I didn't actually make a connection, so you're right. Um, Another thing with deposits that is very important is that different countries use deposits in very different ways. Italy uses its deposit insurance scheme to basically rescue banks, inject capital into banks, et cetera, a bit like the FDIC. The Netherlands really, for example, only use it to pay out depositors. So uh, harmonizing this is going to be very, very tricky. So what do we expect? And I finish with this, uh, Nicola. Package should have, first, a home host issue. I haven't mentioned this, but it's it's enormous for some countries. Here's what happens. As long as you don't have deposit insurance, if you're Slovakia, if you're Belgium, if you're a small country and you have some three or four gigantic banking groups from other countries in Europe, you fear that if there's a banking crisis, they are going to pull other liquidity back to the home country. They're going to leave you holding the can. So what you demand as a host is to demand duplicate liquidity and duplicate capital, which negates all the benefits of the banking union. This is solvable with the deposit insurance. There are other concerns about the home host issue, Nikolai, I don't know if you want to go into this, that are not solvable. For example, when we talk to a small country, they tell us, yeah, but we're afraid that these big countries, for example, now in pandemia, they don't give enough loans to our little firms. We need to have the ability to regulate the subsidiaries. Well, if that's what you want, you don't want a European Union, uh, banking union. So the home host is really tricky. I hope with a good deposit insurance, we can solve it, but it's very tricky. Second element of the package, a deposit insurance. There is full concession in Europe, our first phase of liquidity provision. I think we're going to get that this year. The problem is, where does that lead you? As I, as I told you, we are very Sorry, afraid. Just for, for those of uh, our audience who are not versed in this debate, what, what does this first phase of liquidity provision mean? 
It basically is going to mean that one, the post insurance from Spain is going to be able to borrow when this has this problem that it has a payout to Popular or whatever, it's going to be able to get liquidity. Either forced lending, either like people have forced to lend or some pool lending. We don't know the details, liquidity but in any from case, whom, sorry? from the other deposit insurance. So you mean um, that the French uh, or the Italian deposit insurance would lend to the Spanish one? This could be one solution, which I, I, I mean, I see your skepticism and share it. Ideally, there would be some European deposit insurance. What we say, uh, what my my proposal would be, is we have the single resolution board, which has a single resolution fund, which is going to be up to 70 billion. I think that we need to put resolution and deposit in the same box. And Nicolas has also proposed this with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. But the states at this point, the, the, the governments are very modest with what they want to do with the deposit insurance. And this is really the key thing. If you want countries to advance in other issues, you're going to have to give them some serious deposit insurance. If you want Italy to want to reduce how much sovereign concentrations there is in, in Italian banks, if you want um, other countries to accept the home host, you're going to have to do something more in deposit insurance than by what I was just referring. By sovereign concentration, you mean the, the bias of Italian banks yes. a lot of Italian sovereign Exactly, on exactly. Bank. Thank right. you. That was going to be my fault, but I will say it as said. Um, we need to solve the concentration uh, of, of sovereign bonds in, in national banks. And this concentration has increased gigantically with COVID. Italian banks buying Italian debt, Spanish banks buying Spanish debt, which gives the conditions for a new doom loop if things start to go bad with the banking sector, with loans. We have a lot of unemployment in, 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 in southern countries in Spain already, a lot of unemployment. I think if you look at actually people who do not have a job, not just unemployed, but also on temporary employment schemes, you're at very high levels or crisis levels. Are we starting going to see a banking crisis, people don't pay mortgages, et cetera, and then that's going to go to the state and the state has all these bonds which are back in the banks? We cannot afford that. So what I have proposed using the idea that the, 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 fin the finance minister of Germany put on the table is what I've called the safe portfolio approach, which is basically a forced diversification. Nicola has proposed something that is a kind of putting kind of an extra charge on concentration, I am proposing something like a benefit to diversification. It's, it's, it's a similar thing, basically, which says banks are supposed to be diversified by portfolios of debt of all countries in given proportions, which are equal to their GDP proportions, basically. And if they are go away from that, they should be punished. That would be a way to eliminate these ex excessive exposures, and that would be a third element of the package. And a fourth would have to be to change resolution, the fourth final, change resolution so that you are sure that what happened in Italy, what happened in Germany, which is that the states step in again with rescues, with bailout, etc., doesn't happen, but forcing the European resolution on every bank. Uh, uh, the specific problem is this. There is something called the public interest assessment test. The European resolution system only comes in when it's in the public interest. What does public interest mean? This is decided ex post. Um, because of politics, mm, the states prefer to do wash their laundry, dirty laundry at home. The European regulator is happy not to get involved in these messes. So they tend not to want to do resolution. So one solution should be the European Resolution board gets the deposit responsibility, becomes the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and every bank gets resolution, even the medium or small medium ones. And we don't have the small and medium banks go to national liquidation where the states with the governments in the different countries end up injecting money. So a package with four elements, home host solution, deposit insurance solution, better resolution, and a diversification of sovereign exposures. We think a package that is feasible has to have those four elements. I'm happy to kind of go deep uh, as, as Nicolai and Jeremy uh, want on, on any of the of the four, but this is the basic this is the basic outline. I don't know if I went too too long, too short. If you want me to go in depth into any other thing, uh, no, that was uh, that was a tour de force, uh, Luis, and uh, I think you you covered really uh, the, this, you. this extraordinarily complex matter, which has very many. Uh, you know, moving threads and everything depends a bit on uh, the other thread. So, so, uh, so it's very difficult to disentangle. 
uh, and we'll come back to many of these uh, threads uh, in the discussion. But first, uh, over to you, uh, Jeremy. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. It's a huge pleasure to, to be here. Um, uh, just to emphasize, I'm, I'm speaking here in, in personal capacity, not as a staff member of the, uh, of the IMF. Um, and I'm, uh, of course, far less versed in these topics than both Luis and yourself. So I'm, I'm mainly here to, to learn. Uh, so let, let me just give you a, a general reaction. Um, and uh, by the way, to also mention that the fund is doing uh, new work in this area, but it's it's not out yet, and I'm I don't know exactly where it stands. So not, 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 nothing of what I say is is going to be a preview of that either. I did, however, go back and look at you know one of the earliest comprehensive pieces that were written on on banking union. Um, a banking union for the euro area, it's called, which was a 2013 uh, staff discussion note by the fund. And uh, I, I, I was actually quite impressed. It, it, it feels very, very fresh. <laughs> so maybe going, going back to that, I mean, in, in a sense, the fact that it feels fresh shows that maybe we haven't made as much progress as we wanted, right? Which was Luis's point. And, and so maybe just to sort of restate the, the basic case for banking union in, in this case. So the, the 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 way I would put it is that without banking union, that is without common institutions, supervisory, resolution, deposit insurance, and ultimately also a, a common safe European asset, we will not achieve full financial or banking system integration in the euro area. And that integration is important for two reasons, two quite different reasons. The most obvious one, perhaps, is, is the single market, right? So uh, it, there is no full single market unless we also have a, an integrated market for financial services, which we do not. Um, the banking union is not sufficient to achieve that. We would also uh, need another thing called capital markets union, which has to do with uh, financial instruments that are traded on secondary markets as opposed to bank loans, but the banking union is essential for financial integration and for the single market. Uh, and related to that, and, and perhaps a bit less obvious to, to people who are not in this debate, it is essential for, for macroeconomic and financial stability in Europe. And this refers to the last point that Luis made on uh, exposures uh, of banks to their own sovereigns. So if, as, as is the case right now, public entities, including sovereign entities, borrow primarily from their own banks. You get this mutual dependence between banks and sovereigns. That means that if the sovereign gets into trouble, it will affect the banking system because there are no European layers to protect it, but vice versa also if the banking system, if the, um, if the banking system gets into trouble, it will affect uh, the, the, the sovereign. Um, and, and so the uh, way to uh, get out of that is to introduce those European layers of protections, but also to reduce the extent to which banks hold the bonds of their own sovereigns. And on that front, we have made really very little progress. In fact, you know, the progress has gone the wrong way uh, in, in recent years. Uh, so, um, you know, what, what can, we, uh, can we do about this? So I, I think that Luis's proposals in this area is, are as good as it gets, really. And they are as good as it gets because they do address one of the fundamental obstacles uh, to banking union, which, which has, you know, being something we have observed uh, uh, several times over, over the last few years, namely a, a reluctance in Europe to really share risks. And, and that reluctance comes, really ultimately has to do with trust, right? It has to do with trust in other governments, and it has to do with trust in European institutions to manage risk sharing in a way that doesn't create bad incentives, that it does not allow individual banks or governments to exploit this risk sharing for their own benefit to the, to the detriment of others. And so if you want to address that fundamental fear, 
you have to really go into the nitty gritty of institutional design. And that is what, what Luis is doing and what he just said, and also in, in a paper that he, he issued, I think a few months ago, that goes into, into more detail. Now, maybe to just end my, my remarks, it, it, you know, the question is something like, you know, will banking union ever happen or something? This is what, what, what uh, uh, you know, you asked uh, the title of this, um, uh, of this event. You know, the, the answer is yes, it, it you know, it, it will happen. It may take, it may take a while, but in, in some respects, the chances that it will happen look better now than they did before the pandemic. And, and why is that? It is because there, we have a general sense that on the willingness to share risks, the pandemic has made a difference for the better, right? They have, the pandemic has, you know, thrust the EU into a situation where it really needed to share risk for survival. Fortunately, and this is not obvious, the political will was there. And so we have had some I would say pretty astonishing breakthroughs, the most important of which, of course, is the next generation EU funds. So EU level funds, very large funds, you know, in the, to the tune of uh, 800 billion euros or so, uh, that will be partly lent, partly transferred to member governments for uh, pandemic related spending purposes and that are financed by common borrowing. And that is an astonishing step, which you know, neither Luis and I, I think, would have expected uh, before the pandemic. Nice. On top of that, on top of that, we have had some encouraging signs, particularly, I'm, I'm proud to say, from my own country, from the finance minister of my own country, uh, Germany, that maybe this uh, willingness to entertain intelligent forms of risk sharing extends beyond just the next generation EU funds. So, as Luis reminded us, uh, the German finance minister Olaf Scholz uh, did uh, suggest a willingness to contemplate a form of European deposit insurance. And of course, there has been willingness to contemplate a form of European unemployment insurance, which is another form of, of risk sharing. So this general idea that, by the way, Nicolai and I tried to promote a few years ago when we wrote a paper together with uh, seven other, well, six other <laughs> French and six other German economists, the, the so-called seven plus seven paper, that risk sharing can work and, and, and has to work when combined with uh, proper incentives and in particular with a dose of market discipline, right? This idea, I think, is more accepted today, particularly in Germany, than it was uh, just a few years ago. And that is essentially the spirit mm -hmm. of Luis's proposals. Now, the question, you know, how optimistic should we be on that basis? And, and maybe to mm -hmm. not go overboard with my optimism, there, there is, of course, a, a second problem of why a banking union is so difficult. And in a sense, it has nothing to do with risk sharing across countries. It, it is the fact that, you know, one of the purposes of banking union, uh, in addition to the financial integration purpose that I mentioned at the beginning, is that by moving uh, supervisory and resolution functions to the European level, you would achieve a, a, a degree of distance between um, commercial interests and the supervisory and regulatory authorities, which might contribute to making supervision and regulation and, and resolution uh, more objective, less easy to capture. But of course, the flip side of this is that there are special interests that would be opposed to uh, creating this uh, distance. And those special interests are still there and they make it difficult to achieve some of the progress, including the progress that that Luis uh, envisages. So let me stop here. Uh, I think the, your your last point is uh, is actually quite powerful, and uh, I cannot um, uh, resist the temptation to mention that this argument was made as long ago as 2007 by um, our president here, Adam Posen, who wrote an article in the Financial Times at at uh, uh, in uh, in the summer of 2007, titled "Central Power is a Force for Economic Liberalism." which was exactly about that. So, so view partly on the basis of the um, experience of the 
competition policy of the European Commission that a European institution could succeed better at imposing uh, uh, liberal norms in the economy, in the, in the classical economic sense, um, because it was less captured by local uh, special interests. So, so it's not a new debate. Uh, Louis, uh, how do you react to Yeromin's argument that we can be more optimistic thanks to uh, the impact of the pandemic and the EU response to the pandemic in terms of the completion of the banking union? You've been elected uh, to the European Parliament in 2019, uh, and you've been very central to those discussions since, so, so you're very privileged to observe that particular issue. And please unmute yourself. And there will be one seminar in which those words are not expressed, not with me, sorry. Um, he, he, indeed, uh, well, I, I agree with, with Jeremy's uh, remarks, and, and indeed, uh, I do agree that that there is, there is a window there. Let me say that my optimism would have been much stronger in December than it is now. Uh, in December, we had accomplished, it was a really great year for the European political economy, uh, in a kind of tragic year for our lives and our economies, of course. But uh, because of this impulse from a common crisis in which there was no fear of moral hazard, the fear of moral hazard is really the thing that always stops uh, Germany and other countries from stepping in because they say, well, if we step in, then, then, then other countries are going to take advantage of this ex ante and take more risk. In this case, there was no fear of more hazards. The countries really were hit by a pandemic, which was a clearly external event. And that meant that when in April and May, indeed, the parliament started talking about this new paradigm and this new Brussels consensus, if you want to call it this way, uh, that Jeremy has very well described, whether it's common debt, whether it's... Uh, solidarity in issuing debt with together with with expenditure which is direct expenditure by the union in the states in the member states uh, it started april may uh, we we got we got going with the july council where this was really promising and then we had an end of year where we agreed on a seven year multi-annual seven year budget for the european union which is already in itself an achievement to do it on time and on target on this special recovery facility which is basically uh, for the purposes of actual stimulus is 400 billion uh, euros, uh, which is which is significant for what Europe has. Uh, there is more money, but but 400 billion is direct investment. Um, there was a rule of law mechanism that can demand that states comply, Hungary and Poland, with with rules of law with rule of law requirements. So there was a sense that Europe was moving forward. Why do I say that? And, and that window would exist. Why would I say that now I'm a bit worried? I'm worried because of the of the complete debacle that we've been having with the vaccinations. Um, you would say, well, what does vaccinations have to do with banking union? But I think a lot of, of the sense that, hey, Europe can, yes, we can, uh, which you need this confidence to, to build this trust that uh, Jeremy is, is very much pointing out as, as the basic of basis of all of this construction that you trust the central institutions, you trust each other. It's been very badly eroded by this by this disaster. I mean, if, if we see the US vaccinated in a month and a half, and if we see the UK vaccinated in a month and a half, and we are on track for Christmas uh, vaccinations, and I hope this is not correct, I hope that we get a really good second quarter and we vaccinate. Then if, if we don't achieve this and we go towards Christmas, et cetera, then the whole idea of Europe and of giving more powers to Europe is going to be badly damaged. I don't think there is anything more important in Europe's plate now than to just get this solved. It's just not that we are some months behind Europe uh, between the UK and US, but actually the rate of change is different. So we are falling further behind each day that passes, which is particularly annoying. Uh, it's not just a displaced curve for four months or two months or something. It's actually a different curve. Um, so, so. I would say there is an element of optimism in the way we kind of solved all the economic challenges of the year. There is an element of pessimism in the way the non-economic challenges, which actually are not the competence of the union. The truth is we don't have a common health policy. So the union doesn't, didn't really need to act in these vaccines. It was good that it tried, but it should have tried with good lawyers, and with good member state uh, support. Anyway, that's just too late to, to regret. It's all about contract drafting. 
Um, yes. So, um, <laughs> uh, let me let me. I I have zillions of questions and uh, several already from the audience. Uh, there is, there is a, say, a question from Victor Savin, uh, which may be a way to bring us uh, back to the. Or, or actually, let me start um, um, tying it with uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, Mikis uh, Haji Mikhail uh, asked uh, how the non performing loans, which are going to probably accumulate in uh, in European banks in an asymmetrical way because you know it will be more in some countries than others uh, how does that affect the debate on banking union so uh, so so how do you see the connection between the the credit cycle and financial cycle associated with the covid-19 shock and the structural debate legislative debate about the completion of banking union uh, Luis? i would say uh, Everything, uh, so the key words in this question was asymmetric, right? Everything that is symmetric helps. Everything that, okay, we have a problem, we have to face it together, let's band together and solve it. Let's go to the markets and get uh, uh, new programs helps. The moment this, uh, and as the questionnaire is, is very well hinting, uh, the moment we are in a territory where, you know, maybe next year, uh, Germany, etc., is already out of the hole, starting to tighten belts, starting to pull that fiscal stimulus back, and other countries like potentially Spain will still be in double-digit deficits. I would expect we had double-digit deficits last year. I would expect it will be 21 double-digit and 22 double digits. We will have the higher deficit in European Union in 2020, 2022. Everything that, that pushes in that asymmetric direction makes the politics complicated. I think when you talk about debt sustainability and about uh, and about any of this uh, pulling uh, of of uh, of resources, it's really a political question, right? There is no question that Spain or Italy or whomever it is can handle these levels of debt. There is economically no reason we couldn't. The question is, how are the politics? And your questionnaire is, is really saying, hey, I am scared of these politics because um, if these things become asymmetric, if some banking systems are in trouble and other banking systems are home free, if some states are in trouble and some states are home free, then it's very easy to turn around and say, oh, this is not a problem of Europe. This is a problem of Spain or Portugal, whoever it is, they need to deal with their own troubles. And that starts, and then the moment the market sees that, the market is like, ooh, these guys are on their own. Uh, and, and then it's a, it's a problem. So I would see the problem in three dimensions. PPP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, is allowing the European Central Bank to buy in differentiated ways to preserve the spreads. Uh, it's targeting the spreads, actually, so that uh, it's not more expensive to borrow for certain states than for others. The moment the politics turn against you because the problem is asymmetric, the PPP will have to respect those old rules of, of symmetric buying. Second, obviously, the fiscal rules. The moment some states and not others are in trouble, the fiscal rules get reintroduced and you force a fiscal contraction that might be very damaging. And of course, the banking uh, rules and the, and the possibilities of banking union in which if countries are afraid that by going to banking union, they're going to be held, hold, holding the bag of other countries, then they are much more reluctant to make steps forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know you're constrained in how much you can express views about, you know, forward-looking statements um, <laughs> given the IMF's role in that. But yeah, and so so it's fine if you don't want to answer. But can you give a, enlighten us a bit on the risk of financial fragilities that you see in Europe as a possible consequence of COVID nineteen? Um, I, I think I'd rather not add to okay. <laughs> what Luis has just said, I, which I, which I agree. understand. Uh, so, um, uh, so now I'm coming to Victor Savin's question, which is about sovereign concentration, um, the, the, the issue of sovereign concentrated risk and sovereign concentration charges, or what you have uh, proposed, uh, Louis, the, the safe uh, portfolio concept. Uh, his question is whether that might increase the vulnerability of so sovereigns in times of stress by limiting the pool of available investors for sovereigns. So, so how do you think, uh, Louis, about this trade-off? Um, I mean, I can see what 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 what, uh, what the what the risk that a country like Italy or like or like uh, that that has banks that are really 
ready to invest. In fact, if you talk to the bank's treasuries, they will tell you that they do get these phone calls in which, oh, the auction is a little bit short, or they used to get them in 2011, 2012. The auction is a bit short. We would like you to uh, to, to participate. Um, so, so the concern could be there. I think it could be more there if you just limit, if you just put concentration charges. I think the proposal for a safe portfolio that, that I have put forward eliminates some of the concerns because we're not just saying let's diversify, which could, or let's limit how much debt you buy, which could mean shed your German debt and that's it. But we're saying we want you to have a portfolio that contains bonds of all these countries in these given proportions, that's going to be the safe portfolio, which will give rise to the safe asset eventually. And, and, and that means that you're going to dump some German debt and buy some Slovakian debt and some Italian debt, and the Italians are going to be buying some Spanish debt and so on. So I, I am more less concerned about limiting that ability to purchase in this particular proposal. Um. I have a question from Atanasio Sorfenides, um, who's uh, no stranger to central banking debates, and he asked about to, uh, a follow-up about this issue of liquidity. You mentioned it in the context of deposit insurance, but you know there's a broader question of isn't it the job of central banks to provide liquidity when there is a need for, need for liquidity? And I would add a, a corollary to that, which is, um, do you think the central bank's uh, emergency liquidity assistance concept as we have it in Europe, where emergency liquidity to banks comes from national central banks. Uh, and uh, technically, the lender of last resort function to banks doesn't come from the ECB, it comes from the European Central Bank, even so the ECB also has programs like their long term uh, or refinancing operations. Um, how, how is that connected with the debate on banking union? Uh, and, uh, and specifically, do you think that to have a complete banking union, there should also be a, a reform of uh, the ELA framework? So the ELA framework became kind of a main character in the movie during the financial crisis. We didn't, I don't think, maybe Nicola, uh, some uh, really extreme uh, followers of the debate. I, I, I didn't know it existed until Ireland got in trouble. Um, basically, in a, monetar, in a well functioning monetary union, I don't care if the Federal Reserve of Kansas City or the Federal Reserve of New York are in charge of rescuing the Bank of Cincinnati. To be honest, that is the US Federal Reserve system. And Actually, to me- the, In the early 30s, uh, uh, my co former colleague, Jeremy Sericoen-Seto has uh, written about this. There were frictions in the Federal Reserve system before the 1935 reform Precisely because of that. So, so okay. So it actually even in the U.S. <laughs> but there was something of that nature. <laughs> even in the U.S. So, so I mean, a priori, in a well-functioning system, it shouldn't matter, right? It only matters in a moment of tension and when there is redenomination risk. If we had done enough to eliminate redenomination risk, then it wouldn't matter whether the ELA. Nobody thinks the dollar is going to disappear, and nobody thinks the Federal Reserve of Kansas City is going to be let down by the Federal Reserve of New York. So, if the check is signed by the Federal Reserve of Kansas City today. Nobody will worry, oh my goodness, Kansas City is getting in trouble. It's no Kansas City. So uh, the, the, the fact that the, the um, question arises, and I'm not disputing that it should arise, uh, Nicola, is because we are still in this world where we feel, well, the, all the liquidity to the banks being provided through its ELA facility. If the banks go under and the state goes under and these countries let, is let loose, it is the national bank which is formally on the hook for this. Um, to be honest, this shouldn't be the case. I mean, it should be a central facility. I would advocate for a reserve, for a reform of the ELA. Is physically something ban done by the European Central Bank, but in a way, it's almost a symptom of the disease rather than it's almost a consequence rather than a cause. It's like, look, in a well-functioning world, it shouldn't really matter. Yermin, do you want to add something about this? So one, one argument worth reflecting is whether in an environment where, you know, while this might hopefully be changing, there is a limited appetite to mutualize risks, uh, having uh, ELA constitute a national risk 
uh, but be a, a risk, uh, a decision that is centrally made, right, centrally approved, is not actually quite a good compromise. So, so in other words, the, the thought is that if, if this is fully centralized, perhaps there will be a greater reluctance to use it because the risks would be uh, also entirely central, whereas my understanding is that the fiscal risks are, are currently at the national uh, uh, level. Now, I mean, you, I, in principle, of course, I agree with uh, Louise that in the sense of sharing those risks, it would be good to take them to the European level. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, for, for the most part, no one doubts the ability of national central banks to play the ELA uh, role. Uh, so, so this is sort of, in a second best world, maybe what we have right now is not, not so bad. Just okay, my personal you, view, of course. What you're, what you're saying is there is flexibility, for example, say in Cyprus, uh, we're able to accept, uh, you know, dead mice as collateral, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, uh, so, so that flexibility is useful in crisis management, right? Basically, yes. Um, I have a number of questions about instruments for banking policy, which are somewhat related to, uh, to banking union. So um, um, there's a question, for example, from uh, Fabio Balboni about bad banks. And Christine Lagarde has referred to um, domestic bad banks. Um, uh, she said the European bad bank would only come after domestic bad banks and not necessarily. Uh, Andrea Enria, as the head of the single supervisory mechanism, has been a long-standing advocate of, uh, of either domestics or European bad banks. He expressed preference for the later. Um, so he's um, he's asking whether you know um, basically what what should we think about the debate? Uh, bad banks and the interplay between domestic and, uh, and European in the context of uh, of you know a future rising NPLs, non-performing loans, and, uh, and, and, and uh, the legacy from the COVID-19 shock. Uh, Luis. I, I think that uh, I fully support Andrea's position. We've been writing and we've been pushing for European bad bank. Let me just say that, I mean, our, our audience is aware that the bad bank concept doesn't fit as much this crisis as previous crises, uh, just to put that clearly on the table. If you kind of want to take out all the housing assets from some Spanish saving banks and you want some New York real estate analyst to analyze it, he probably can or she probably can just look at prices of real estate, state conditions. Somebody can send him pictures of the area and she can kind of have at least the back of the envelope valuation allows it to talk about the portfolio. When we're talking about loans to small and medium-sized enterprises, which is what we're going to talk about, uh, bars, restaurants, 70% of the restaurants, bars, and hotels in Spain are probably insolvent right now, according to the Bank of Spain. Many of those are viable, okay? More than half are insolvent, but viable. But they are insolvent because there's just this loss of, of, of access to, 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 uh, to customers and to revenues that, that is, is just gigantic. Um, so, how do you trade loans of bars? How do you discuss if these bars in this area of town are viable or not? Uh, it depends on soft knowledge, on, on specific information from the customers, from the owner. From um, So a bad bank is, is a little bit less of a good solution. Now, having said that, I do think that a bad bank needs to be not national, but European. I think that uh, having resigned ourselves, like, and yes, the answer partly is yes, it seems like Europe is resigning itself to not having a European solution to these NPLs. Resigning ourselves to not having a European solution to the NPLs and to actually having uh, national bad banks is pushing in the direction of the first phrase that both I and, and, and Nicola and Jeremy talked about, the, the, doom, the doom loop and the fact that concentration, these, these risks, that, that is the whole point that we want to avoid. We want to avoid the possibility that this whole vicious circle restarts. And if we have a bad bank which is national, then all these bad risks are dumped into the national treasury. Fiscal risk, which is showing up eventually into the bonds, who knows, depending on the politics in the European Central Bank, in which case the banks which are concentrated on all these sovereign exposures are in trouble. And we're back to, 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 to the same point uh, that we precisely want to avoid. So absolutely, 
um, the solution to these bad loans needs to be a European one. And I'm so sorry that it does look sorry. And, and yes, to your question, to our questioner, uh, like it's going to be uh, national solutions. There's an interesting question by Lion Lee, uh, who is asking how would empower the ESM and increase its capital capacity be a feasible solution to the, as a backstop liquidity provision? And actually, um, that's a, an interesting question right now, because we have this bond issuance capacity of the EU itself through next generation EU. So is the ESM still part of the picture, or do you think that future solutions for European backstop will be through the EU budget process and the ESM? How do you see that interplay going forward? The ESM right now has and developed And the ESM, this... sorry, is obviously the European stability mechanism, the, the fund in Luxembourg that was created in 2012. So this is very important that you give the institutional detail. The ESM is not a European Union institution. It's an institution created as an SPV, a special purpose vehicle in Luxembourg by the member states to help uh, finance the Portugal, Greece uh, rescues and, and so on. And so the problem, uh, the ESM right now has taken a backstop, a back step, not because it's fundamentally different from other programs, the SURE program is also providing just liquidity and has been used happily, but because of the stigma politically in, in the main place that could be having access to it, and actually I think Draghi might change this, but the main place where they could be having access to it, uh, which is Italy, in Italy, it's a bump. I mean, just talking about the ESM makes everybody panic. Every single politician runs for cover, which means that as a result, Spain is also reluctant to use the ESM. So the ESM needs a rebranding exercise. We need to stick it into the treaties. We need to make it a European instrument. We need to bring it into European community law. We need to give it a new name. And then we can use it for all sorts of nice things like, of course, as a backstop to banks and as a possibility to, to fund this bad bank. I mean, it's there is this money, it's enormous, and we're going to sit on it and not do anything for it with it. So it should be used. But I think for that, those two steps need to be taken. Um, we need to do this, putting it into community law and kind of uh, reframing, rebranding. I would be curious about what Jeremy thinks yeah, about me this. Too. Uh, um, I, I basically agree with... Um, with Luis, um, but this is again my, my personal view. Um, we have a, a question from Arnab Das. Um, so I'll, I'll move because we're getting uh, close to the end of our session. I'll move to a number of kind of big picture political questions and why okay. don't I bundle them together? There's a, there's a question from Arnab Das whether we're um, putting the card before the horse. Shouldn't you first need you know a big kind of agreement on political and fiscal union, and then you can create a deposit insurance and all these backstop and, and resources to, to manage crisis. Uh, there's a question, uh, an intriguing question from Matthias Cabrera on whether the failure of Greenfield Bank and the implication it has for DGS, uh, especially with all these German municipalities that are losing all their deposits uh, at Greenfield Banks, uh, will that have an impact on the outcome of the uh, reform of the crisis management and deposit insurance. This is uh, happening in real time these days. Um, there is a, a comment, which is also a question from Ted Truman, saying, OK, yeah, in the US, we have the FDIC, but it took us a very long time to get there and to get the practice of the FDIC right. So um, I guess his implication is, you know, aren't you a bit too um, demanding in asking for completion of the banking union now, given the many generations it took uh, on the on the U.S. side, and also um, I had a question, uh, but I don't remember from whom. Um, whether um, oh yeah, no, there was an anonymous uh, question actually on whether the forthcoming elections in Germany and France are going to affect the picture of this decision making, and also the, the fact that these uh, decisions are forthcoming, um, and also ultimately. I mean, how much of this matter? Uh, now that we have next generation EU, we have an assertive European Central Bank. Um, assuming that, you know, Louis, nobody uh, listens to your uh, recommendations and uh, there is absolutely zero progress toward banking union in the next few years, um, is that really dangerous given all the progress that has been made uh, by, uh, you know, the European uh, economic and financial policy framework, uh, particularly through uh, the pandemic. So um, 
I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for, for questions. And so I personally would have many more uh, and, uh, and maybe uh, giving you the floor back, Luis and Jeremy. Um, Jeremy. Jeremy, you want to take the ones that you feel comfortable answering and then I do the rest? I know your situation is always a little bit more tricky. Maybe I'm, I'm just going to make a, a general comment on, I think, the last or penultimate point, uh, which is, you know, how urgent is this? this all. Um, and, you know, this is a broader question. It, it also, for example, applies to the question of uh, fiscal adjustment uh, at some point, right? So, so we have had the ECB play a fantastic role uh, in this crisis. And indeed, it has ensured stability. And therefore, in some sense, taking off the pressure uh, as far as more fundamental reforms are concerned. But let's not forget that the cons co political consensus behind this role was really driven by the pandemic. And at some point, this is going to start to wear off. And so I, yes, I do think that just because Europe has done very well uh, uh, in this crisis in a macro financial sense, you know, except, of course, for the obvious enormous output losses, right? But there has not been a stability concern in Europe. That that should not be taken as a, a you know, an indication that we can delay reform. So I do think that these and other reform issues are important to address. And if even if they are not implemented in the short run, it is important to give a trajectory, right? To give a sense out there that we have a plan uh, going forward. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Jeremy, and I, I would I would also add to that last question about the ECB that um, we don't want a system that depends on the heroics of the European Central Bank to survive. Yes, they are reacting well. I, I would actually argue that it's precisely the fact that ECB was constrained. I agree with Jeremy that the pandemic was important, but it's also the fact that the ECB was constrained. It was constrained that was key. Remember. When was the Karlsruhe ruling? For those of, of our guests who don't, who don't know this story, the Constitutional Court in Germany really clipped the wings brutally of the ECB, and particularly of the Bundesbank, uh, just in, in May. I, I, it, was, it was just a moment that the crisis was at its worst, and we were all panicked. I, I, Jeremy probably knows this firsthand. I just guess. But from the perspective of Merkel, um, the final impulse to do this fiscal mutualization cannot have been a coincidence that it happened when the ECB, super, super ECB to the rescue was kind of, okay, well, we need some fiscal arm because the monetary arm is maybe going to be constrained, right? So I think that we can't just have a system that depends on the one European institution that does it all, that provides us stability, that provides us uh, counter-cyclical policies, that is always there to stabilize. That is just not a healthy situation. I know banking, the central bankers are rescuers everywhere, but this is too much. Um, elections in Germany and France. Uh, uh, I would say Germany, if we're going towards the fashionable, you know, the Germans like all these colors, the traffic light coalition, the green, red, and orange, F F liberals, greens, and uh, socialists, then I would think that we have scope for some further advances in Europe, uh, and that would be that would be a phenomenal, uh, a phenomenal uh, room for progress. Uh, also very good for my liberal uh, partners. Uh, France, um, I think that the French pres presidency is a very good opportunity to do some of these things that we're talking about. We, we, if we can manage to push them over the border in these next few months and then have them ready for Macron to really get them in council, that would be a very good thing. The third, I'm going backwards in your five questions. FDIC, aren't we a bit demanding on getting an FDIC very fast? Well, we have the SRB. We have the, the, uh, res re um, the rescue fund that can do resolution, but cannot be deposit insurance. If we put the deposit insurance of the member states to be coordinated by the resolution fund, we just one step from there. It's not so far. The tools of the FDIC, we already have. Nicolas did for us for the European Parliament a report on those tools. And, and, and he was not very pessimistic. I mean, Nicolai, you are, you are 
admirably silent on things on which you are the world expert. So that's 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 impressive. But but you wrote all of this, and I I don't think we would be so far from having those tools if we just had the means and the political wills and the and the right legislation to actually. actually this one was written jointly with Anna Gelpern, who was uh, 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 also in the last session of financial statements. So this is all a bit too. Uh, no, no, it's, Maybe. It's, it's good, with Anna Gelpern, indeed. Um, a green field, uh, well, anything that makes the municipalities and the regions in Germany doubt their institutional protection schemes and all of these things is good for European deposit insurance. The deposit insurance Mark I died because of the German sparkassen. Everybody in Brussels knows this, I guess, outside of Brussels is boxed properly as well. Um, they, they feel that they are not getting the right regulatory treatment. They want to be accepted from the whole deposit insurance. They think that they already have enormous support because they insure one another. People who look at it from the outside, and I would love to hear German, although this is, if something's politically sensitive, this is one. Uh, from the outside, it looks like a very uncertain system that allows for potentially support and potentially not support and nobody knows how much support and when Nord Elbe comes in which is a, not a spark as a regional bank but nobody actually wants to put any money for it in all these IPSs um, so so we are not sure how well these IPSs work and anything that makes the the, 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 the municipalities kind of want something more solid might might help um, the municipal the, the spark casting and all the rest of the system and ah, the cart and the horse, that was the first question. I went back through the five. The cart and the horse, yes. I mean, wonderful. Let's have a political union. And then, have, uh, I mean, we have to be realistic, right? I mean, when you read the Hamilton biography, one thing that is striking is how little the politics are, right? You're thinking of these big, big kind of trade-offs that we're going to just get the, you know, but at the end of the day, there are some guys who want the capital in Virginia. And there are some guys who want to save their own bonds. And there are some guys who want, you know, and, and Hamilton's genius is to kind of make a package with all these guys and say, okay, we put the capital in Washington. We assume the debt, we have a treasury, we issue debt. Everyone's like, whoa. I think that's how things happen. That's how institutional evolution happens. And I'm hoping that's how it happens in Europe. Thank you, Nicola. It was, uh, Thank you so much. We're slightly over time, but uh, that was well worth it. There are many questions we can take from Benjamin Heinrich, Paula Monteros Veroni, Reinhold Rekes, uh, Mark Dobler in particular. Uh, but this was, uh, to me, an extremely enlightening session. I'm particularly grateful to uh, Yermin for having uh, accepted to speak and share a number of very substantial points despite the institutional constraints uh, and, uh, and for which for his candor, because you, you really gave us uh, a lot of uh, uh, color uh, and insight on the, the politics of all this and not just about Queen Elizabeth. Um, our next session will be in uh, three weeks time, not the usual two, and it will be with the commission actually, with Commissioner Merit McGuinness, uh, who is responsible for financial services, uh, so on April 15th, uh, and in the meantime, um, uh, have a great rest of your day and thanks again for uh, being faithful to our financial statement series. Thank you very much, Nicolai, and thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all, all the listeners for the questions.